Welcome to this God-inspired message from Shofar Christian Church. Enjoy today's message. May you experience the presence of our Father and may you grow deeper in your relationship with Him. So um, in the in the there's a some of you may not know there's a place called the green room right or the holding room that's where they put the speakers in so I was there and then I had a young lady she's four her name is Emma so Emma walked in and uh, and then her eyes revolved around the strawberry so I invited Emma to participate in the strawberry. Little did I know that Emma won't stop participating in the strawberry so. She said, another pigeon, another pigeon, another pigeon. I'm like, okay, Emma, you can go. But then I don't know where to stop, when, when, what to do now. Because she's like, is this leaf for strawberry? Yes. And, and, and then she kept going. And then dad walks in. Dad obviously a bit embarrassed. You're not supposed to be here. I'm thinking to myself, oh, well, well, tell a child that. A strawberry and a guest room. It just doesn't understand the context of that. She just thinks strawberry. And I was, so I was just enjoying that. It actually ties into my message about reconciliation of this morning, um, the which I want to talk to you about. Whereas why I mentioned this four-year-old is that um, children can sometimes minister to you in ways that sometimes adults can't. Not by what they say, but by who they are. And you see in them such innocence and purity, which reminds us of some of the things we lose as we grow older. So as we grow older, sometimes we grow out of fundamental principles we're supposed to retain of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I was seeing something in her that was so innocent and so pure. And, and I thought to myself, this is so beautiful. You know, so she doesn't have the kind of consciousness of the environment around her, what it means, what this room, who's this room for, who's strawberries. In fact, I invited her to one strawberry. I didn't know that I opened up a whole can of worms. And so, because after one strawberry, she, because and then she keeps, and now she finishes one and she stares at the strawberry, which makes me feel bad. I said, yeah, you can do another one. And then she takes another one and she finishes another one and then she looks again. And I feel bad again. I'm like, okay, you can take another one. But then I realized at some point this has to end, right? Because it's also not my strawberries to give away. <laughs> when, where, where, where do we end this? How do we... How do, we, how do we navigate this conflict here? You know, how do we safely navigate this conflict of the strawberry without any hearts being broken? So a dad walked in and saved the day. And so um, my slide first. Yeah, can you put up my slides? So um, today I want to talk to you about something that God had laid in my heart. And uh, some of you know this old man, right? Okay, you must know that old man. Angus Beckham. So um, I have a privilege... I don't know, I mentioned it yesterday. I can't tell you really how it happened. Um, I mean, of being invited to Mighty Man conferences throughout South Africa and preaching to a number of people. We can put up the next slide. Um, so one of the things that happened, and I mentioned yesterday, is that I had the privilege. I've been doing Mighty Man conferences for many years. And I said to you, the first time I preached, I thought I preached a bad message to the degree that I thought nobody would invite me again. And... On the contrary, they kept inviting me. I just didn't know why. And, and so, but then I realized that part of what I was thinking is that I thought people are judging me based on how I preached that first might man. But actually, people were judging me by who I was on the stage, not what I said. So they remembered the impact of who I was more than the impact of what I said. In other words, you can teach, you can preach from what you know, but there's power in demonstration and the life lived. The gospel of a life lived is more impactful than the gospel of, a, of, of preaching. So this one is um, three and a half thousand men coming to Jesus. So I was asked here, they the last mighty man in Middleburg, and then they ask us, all the speakers who have been in a previous Mighty Man, to share briefly. Then they ask me to conclude. And in a conclusion, then I make the article. So one of the things that happens there is that, 
because we come from different church backgrounds and different, doc different doctrines, and you know, you have to tread carefully. Some people are cessationists and, and all that. And I'm, I'm like the charismatic flight, you know, uh, speak, tongue speaking, devil chasing, uh, you know, swinging the chandelier. I mean, I'm like, the, I mean, there's hardly a limit. I mean, I go all the way. So, but I have to hold myself back because some people are like, you know, they don't know any, any, any only sign they want, the only sign they know is a stop sign. You know, they don't, you know, they don't believe in signs and wonders. The only sign they know is a stop sign. And, and so I believe in signs and wonders and all of that. And so, and one of the things that happen is that some of the guys, they will make an article for salvations, but prefer not to call people to the front, lest inconveniencing them, you know, making them uncomfortable. Now, I'm the, I'm the old school guy. I'm in the old school gospel. The old school gospel is that you're not ashamed of Jesus Christ. And so this prayer of salvation somewhere in the crowd where nobody sees you and you just confess Jesus, they're silent. I don't do that story. I don't know. I'm saying, I, when I sinned, I sinned publicly. I don't know about you. I, didn't, I never sinned privately. I was, a, I, was, I was a public sinner. My sins were like a public. I was drinking publicly. I was, I was doing things publicly. So there's no reason for me to walk with Jesus now privately. So I make the article, and I wait, and I call people to the front, and I challenge them to come to the front, and they come, and we pray. One year, the Lord challenged me uh, to do baptism in the Holy Spirit. Now, please, I mean, this, this is a lot of men, and you know the church does. Some people don't believe in tongues. Some people do believe in tongues. And we are like, tongues are the apostles, the miracles end of the apostles, and no, 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 and all kinds of stuff. I tell people, if you don't believe in miracles, that's fine. You might change your mind the day you need one. So I tell people, oh, you don't believe miracles, that's okay. You might change your mind the day you need one. For now, leave me alone. I believe miracles, I need lots of miracles. So let me walk. You keep your story, I keep my story. You might change your mind one day, right? And so, now the Lord challenged me to do baptism in the Holy Spirit. You know what happens baptism in the Holy Spirit? We don't just pray for people to receive the Holy Spirit. We pray to people to receive with the results of speaking in tongues. It's not just we hope you receive the Holy Spirit. We're looking for something. So we activate. So we're actually praying for you with the intention that you speak in tongues, preferably now. <laughs> not sometime in, in the three weeks' time. Preferably like now. Like speak. No Africans, no English, no Tosa. No Zulu. Tongues. That's what we're here for. Don't tell God you love him. You will tell him you love him later on. Lord, you are, not, you are a good God. No, 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 not today. We are for tongues. So when your mouth opens, we, your mouth opens tongues. That's what you're going to receive. You know, rivers of living waters shall flow. These things are done by faith, right? You don't do these things if you don't have faith. If you are facilitating and you're back and forth, you're not going to walk in the supernatural. When you call for people to pray for the sick, you don't think, you don't pray, call for them and say, I, I hope you get sick. No, 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 you don't, you don't bother. You, know, you don't say, I'm going to pray for the sick, I hope somebody gets healed. The devil sits there and think, I'm going to, you know. You got to be like, I believe God, somebody's going to get healed. That's how you do it, or you don't do it at all. You push. So I prayed for Baptist and Holy Spirit, and the night before, one and a half thousand guys got saved and I, from somebody's preaching on Friday, then I asked those guys who got saved to come to the front. I said, all of you got saved last night. You were the first to come. And they came and filled the space. And, you know, the strange thing is this. Or oh, before I did this, I don't know why I'm saying this story, but I think it's good, relevant. So before I did it, I shared it with the guys at the VIP tent, you know, the main guys. I shared with them. And then I made a mistake by sharing that. Because one guy said, no, but in the Bible... Is baptism in water first, and then Holy Spirit. And I said, okay. I thought, let me not get into an argument here. Um, because, I mean, it's just one instance where it's water and then baptism in the Holy Spirit. It's not, it's not a sequence. But I'm not going to get into doctrinal argument here. I kept my mind. So at 4 o'clock on Saturday morning, I said, this is at 10. I wake up from bed. I cannot go to sleep. The Holy Spirit stares at me. I'm like, I'm in trouble. I am like, if it's the last mighty man I'm preaching in, then that's it. I'm going to obey God here. If it's the last session they give me, I'm going out on a limb. <laughs> and I did. Now, the strange thing about praying for that kind of prayer on Saturday morning outside in the open, it scares you. It's like we're looking for, it's like it's better when there's an environment, an ambience. Maybe evening, you know, with the music playing or some inside venue. Morning, sunlight, open. Holy Spirit. 
So now me having announced this thing I'm going to do, I am now doubting. I'm like, yo, hey, what did you just say? Holy Spirit, where? Are you sure? So I'm doubting what I just announced because it doesn't look like it would happen. You know, it's like there's no, there's no feeling, you know, the like feeling of a venue and a, like the Lord moving, you know, just must move in a building. And so I did the altar call and p- prayed for people and God, God, and God baptized the Holy Spirit. And, and then one day we're in Cape Town in a vineyard conference. I walk into the conference venue. And so a young man behind the counter stands up. There's a man who baptized me. I thought, I've never baptized a white guy. I would know. <laughs> I said, no ways. Then he reminds, that's years later, he reminds me that I'm the one who baptized him the Holy Spirit. I had forgotten about it. But he sees me and he remembers that the encounter with the Holy Spirit was in that meeting in the, in, in the Eastern Cape. And I'd forgotten about it. That's obedience, right? Later on that year, I'm, I'm Ruth from the member who does the PA for Mighty Man, she tells me, one day we're having coffee in Middleburg. She says to me, do you remember the, says the guy with the wheelchair? I says, what guy in the wheelchair? I have no clue what she's referring to. She thinks I know, I have no reference. What guy in the wheelchair? But the guy who was in your meeting in the wheelchair, I said, what do you mean? Because I announced signs and wonders in the meeting and nobody seemingly got healed from my observation. She says to me, you know, the guy who came in your session, he came on the wheelchair, he left driving his wheelchair. And I didn't even know that until months later, that God did move. And I was not even sure that he would move. But it did move. And he didn't tell me that it did move. <laughs> I don't know about you, but Jesus, some of the stuff that he does, I'm not very happy with some of the stuff he does. <laughs> I mean, he's moved, and he's not even trying to whisper to me that I did do something to make me feel good. It's like, I don't have to tell you that I've used you. <laughs> Which is, it, will, it will help to say something. But it doesn't have to do it. So at the Mighty Man conferences, everywhere I travel in South Africa, I've become aware of the impact of what Jesus has done to the degree that I don't know all the stories and I don't need to know all the stories. I'll walk into a church building and a guy would say to me, you have no idea how my life was changed because of you. I'm like, I don't know. He knows. And like that song did, we will live and die and we'll be forgotten, but glory goes to him. I don't know, I don't need to know so long as the master knows. Amen? So now, the issue of reconciliation is, 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 is a difficult one. Um, we can put a slide on. Yeah. So the action of mediating between two comp- disputing peoples or groups. Now, we know this in 2 Corinthians 5. You know, again, there's another word, therefore, again, that is used. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. If anyone is in Christ, is a new creature. Therefore, it says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, is a new creature. Not First Second Corinthians five seventeen. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. But it starts with the therefore. Therefore, because it's actually a continuation of a thought that Paul writes. So he talks about that we know no man after the flesh, but after the spirit, and so on and so on and so on. And then in relation to that, in view of the facts presented above, this is a conclusion thereof. So in view of the fact that we don't know men after the flesh, in view of the fact that those whom Christ has died for should no longer live for themselves, but they should live for him. In view of that, therefore. Anyone who's in Christ is a new creature. All things have passed away and everything has become new. And it talks about that God has, you know, he's, has, has not called our sins up against us and is not imputing our sins against us, but he has given to us a ministry of reconciliation. Now, we're, we're given a ministry. Ministry is not something that you do because you feel like it. Ministry is a duty. It's a service. So, in other words, there are no people who are called for reconciliation and others are not. Everyone who's who's a new creation, everyone who's in Christ, he's given the ministry of reconciliation. It's for all of us. He's given us a ministry of reconciliation. And secondly, he has given us a word of reconciliation. Message of reconciliation. In other words, everything we do and everything we say should be reconciliatory. So we both have a ministry of reconciliation and the message of reconciliation. What we do and what we say should always be reconciliatory. And that's for the whole church, not some of its parts. We are given that ministry. And in Matthew 5, in the Beatitudes, Jesus says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall inherit the kingdom of heaven. Not blessed are the peacekeepers. 
but blessed are the peacemakers. You don't need peacemakers unless there is conflict. So we are not called to run from conflict. We are called to run to conflict. To diffuse the fragrance of peace inside conflict. That's what we are called for. But it's not easy. It's not easy. Put up the next slide there and show you. Okay, put past that, past the scripture. Now, I want to show you something that I mentioned yesterday, how difficult it is. And I didn't know how difficult it is. Okay, so when I'm talking about racism, please understand, I never come to the conclusion that all white people are racist. Never did I come to the conclusion that some people are not racist. I do not know. I have no prejudgment as to know who's racist or not. But I don't, I've never been, I've never prepared myself inside of me that I can walk into a Mighty Man conference or any conference around the country and encounter racist people. I never knew the context. But now I know that the hearts of people, as Jeremiah says, is deceitful above all things, including mine. So I now know that singing Christian song doesn't mean a person has been changed and converted. I know that. Therefore, I don't go with an expectation that people are extremely evil, neither do I go with the expectation that people are extremely good. I just have to give a person an opportunity to prove themselves who they are. I don't judge, therefore, because I don't see the point. Let the person expose themselves by their conduct rather than even prejudging who they are before they have an opportunity to expose themselves. Now, because of that, because of experience of being cross-cultural in ministry, I encounter people who are still on the borderline of this message, of this. So, so what do you do with people in life? You either are antipath, you have antipathy, that is hatred, deep-seated hatred for people because of, of race. That's called antipathy. As feelings of aversion. Or you have apathy, you lack interest. You are apathetic. You're not, you're neither here nor there. You're not interested in their struggle. You're not interested in what they're facing. You're just, you're apathetic. That's one. Or you have what is called sympathy, feelings of pity. You pity the person, you feel sorry for the person and their misfortune, but you go no further than that. So you either have antipathy, extreme aversion or hatred for the person, or you're apathetic, you're not interested, it's just whatever. Or you have sympathy, you've got some feelings of pity for the person. And then or you have empathy, the ability to understand and share the feelings of another. Now, let me give you an understanding of where you could judge yourself and what stage you are around that. How you know you're racist or not is not so much what people say about you or any of us, is that if something affects somebody who looks like you, whether it's a tragedy or some event happens or to people who look like you and you feel much stronger around that thing than if it happens to people who look different from you, same incident, then you know you're racist. Let me repeat that again. If tragedy or something takes place and affects somebody who looks like you and your feelings of being broken are heightened more than it happened to somebody who looks differently from you, then you're a racist. I know we live in a racist world because in 1993, 800,000 Rwandans were killed and the world hardly moved. But when, when 3,000 Americans were killed in the Twin Towers, the world came to a standstill. I know we live in a racist world. The first time Facebook had a safe mode, safe check-in, safe mode, whenever the tragedy, is when it happened in Europe. And when they were called out, they opened up that facility to everyone around the world, but it's only when people reacted to their selectiveness. Otherwise, it never was there that you could actually check yourself in and safe if you were not. It happened only when something happened, I think, in France, over some floods that happened in France. So we live in a racist world, where empathy is felt stronger when somebody looks like you than if it, when, it's, when it's somebody who's different. But also beyond that, how do you know you, you, are, you are caught up in toxic masculinity and patriarchy is when you think gender-based violence is a problem for women. When your feelings of aversion towards violence and, and uh, sadistic violence that we see in terms of rapes and all that, when you think it's not your problem, then you have a problem. When you think something is not your, it's not your problem, it is an indication that you have a problem. Your humanity has been affected negatively. Your bowels of compassion, Matthew chapter 9, Jesus preached to multitudes, then, but he says when he lifted up his eyes 
and saw all the multitudes, that they had a sheep without a shepherd. Then it says, he had compassion on the multitudes. So he had already preached to many others and warned so many others, but when he saw the work is still great and there's still many to be reached, his bowels of compassion were moved. And it says, pray to the Father to send laborers into his harvest field. We are humans. And at our base level, God has given us the ability to empathize and to, to feel for people, regardless of how differently they are from us. And so to have the heart of Jesus is to bypass the limitations, the, the social engineering of this world and the structures that limit and the laggers and the enclaves and the stuff that makes us being indifferent to each other. We want to walk like Jesus because we owe Jesus our lives because he's given us his life. All right, so we're not so much even doing him a favor, really. <laughs> He's done us a favor. Ours is simply to reciprocate. So now, the next slide I want to show you, um, yeah, I can pass and show the, those of you who don't know this gentleman, it's, um, why can I forget his name immediately? My mind. Uh, former Minister of Police, uh, Adrian Flock. This is Adrian Flock, former Minister of Police under apartheid government. So I'm with Adrian Flock. We're preaching together in Cockstad. And Adrian is a born-again Christian. Right? He's changed. We're sharing a platform in Cockstad. And then he talks about what it means to be involved in the apartheid um, police and sending the, the hippos and the police into the townships with tear gas and shooting black people. He, he shares that. He shares about meeting in parliament with, and the PW Bota and what happened there. He shares about the clandestine operation of the previous nationalist government. That there will be a meeting in parliament and then Bota will call him aside and say, that is unofficial, not, not recorded. They'll call him aside and says, please take care of that. So therefore there were no records of some of the stuff that was sanctioned because he was only told one on one what to do. And he was the only one who went to the TRC to confess. Others says, you will feel guilty, you deal with your stuff. We're not coming to that but he was sharing about the consequence of sin. So one of the messages says, he says, sin has consequences, brethren. That's what his message. I can't visit my children now in London because I'm a convicted criminal. Sin has consequences. I said he kept saying. So I'm listening to him sharing his story and the bombing of Kosato House in here in, in Johannesburg, the, po the poisoning of Frank Chicane's clothes when he flew to New York, almost killed Frank Chicane. And a number of things that they did, you know, one of them that he shared that actually shook me and almost like moved me. I feel like I'm not, I'm not all right. And I don't know this guy, he, this evil that they did. He said they were flying some Roy Flag helicopters, I think it's in Lesotho, Switzerland, or somewhere, looking for terrorists, ANC terrorists. And they were sure that they were in this heart, and they released rocket launches into this heart. Blew the, past, the, the house apart, only to find that it's only women and children there, but they're all dead. So I'm listening to that, and I'm supposed to still preach after this guy. <laughs> so I'm thinking, yes, Lord, this is a mess. This is a mess. Our lives are a mess. The country's past is a mess. We're in a mess here. But what I don't understand about Jesus, maybe you can, tell, you can help me understand it. <laughs> Why does he leave us in a mess? I mean, I find him fascinating. He fascinates me. Jesus does not fix messes. He fixes people who fix messes. <laughs> Let me do that again. You tell Jesus, Lord, there is crime in South Africa. Jesus says, yes, I know. That's why I have you there. <laughs> Jesus, there's poverty. Yes, I know. That's why I have you there. In other words, he does nothing unless he does it through us. Lord, there is this. Yes, I know, my child. That's why I have you there. For every problem, God raises a person. There's, about, there's thousands of animals that need to be given names. It's a problem. God is not getting involved. Adam, <laughs> there's a problem here that needs to be resolved. I think you're capable of this. You give them names, whatever you say, it is it. 
Oh, 10,000 species of animals. So imagine goat, goat, cattle, cow, monkey, giraffe. I mean, that, I don't know how long that would take. But that is quite a mission. Chimpanzee, ape. I mean, that's like long. He gives animals to every, names to every animal. So I find God, he works like that. He, he leaves things not completely done because he wants us to be co-laborers. God, I think God works like this. I think he thinks that he doesn't want to deprive us of the opportunity of partnering with him to solve the stuff he needs. So he thinks it's a privilege for us to hold hands with him and work with him as to steward his creation. I think he thinks that we will miss out if we didn't have a part to play in what he does. So he lived some of the stuff. You remember in Israel? In Israel, he never killed all the giants. Remember when they were supposed to inherit the land? He says, I cannot kill, lest I cannot kill all the nations, uh, the head, Tittites, Jebusites, lest the animals or the beasts take over and overrun the land. So, and suddenly, you won't learn how to do war if everything has been cleaned out. So you need to still learn how to fight. So let's leave some so you learn how to walk. During Joshua, they couldn't kill. They must make sure the next generation can still fight. That's a God we serve, isn't it? He's amazing like that. So, does it make it easy? It's, not, you know, it's not, still not easy. One day, at a mighty man, on a Wednesday, we arrive there. The mighty man starts on a Friday, so we get there by Wednesday. You know, we rest, settle in, and we see people driving, driving, driving all over the country. It's an amazing sight to see. GPNC, AWC, the whole country comes in. Middleback. Middleback was like the big one. So they come all over. People put up their tents. So you are there early, watching tents go up. Stage, stage goes up. You know, it's like the whole thing. It's beautiful. And the next thing, um, because I'm one of the, I'm, uh, I'm one of the speakers, so I'm, I'm VIP. Okay. Yeah, I'm VIP. And sometimes it's, it's nice to be VIP. It's a privilege. You know, it's one of those. It's a packs. One of those packs that come with. So initially, when I went to preach, I thought I was a B. I was a quota. I wasn't sure why they invited me. Am I a quota? I was, I was self-conscious. I had issues. I said, am I a quota? You know, a little did I know that obviously can I do that. But one day, so I made the Mighty Man Conference, and so we are there, said from a Wednesday, and then there's a vendor area. The vendor area is where people sell their stuff, their wares, shirts, and so I have my books there at the vendor area. So. I drive in, so, so the vendor area, because middle bag is, is dry, it's karumos, you know, it's dry, so it's dusty. So they have to sprinkle water around the place, you know, just to, to get the dust down. And so I go to this, the air, vendor area is cordoned off, uh, because it's for, for vendors, as I say. So I get in, stop by the gate, there's, there's, there's a, I use the phrase, because it's used, the colored gentleman at the gate, then he gestures for me to drive in, so he allows me to drive in. And so based on his instruction, I drive in because he's given me the gesturing. So I drive in. So when I'm driving in, I'm now driving in to find my stall to put up my books you know, early on, maybe on a Thursday, so that by Friday, I've set up my stall. So I drive in. As I drive in, a gentleman comes out of a tent angry already. <laughs> and he goes, Apparently, I've done something wrong. I shouldn't have driven it in. But now, remember, I have somebody at the gate who guessed it for me, driving. Who's manning the gate? Now, not somebody who's just passing in there and driving in. He's the guy who's in charge of the gate. He guessed it for me to drive in. This guy comes to the tent, angry. I'm like, what is going on? But now, he's more angry than the fact that I'm not responding the way. You know when you're, you know when you're angry? And then the person you're angry against is not catching your anger. And then that makes you even more angry. So they're like, they're cool about it. You are, you are boiling, the person is cool. That makes you boil even more. You know, your child, I mean, I do this. <laughs> I do this with my daughter. It doesn't work now. I didn't realize it doesn't work. I stare at her, she stared back. <laughs> Which defeats the whole purpose because the whole purpose is to scare her. She stares back, thinks a joke, and... Uh, I'm, bro I'm like, no, nah. I'm like, it doesn't work. I'm like, oh, man. Because children are not supposed to fear you, supposed to respect you. I grew up with parents whom we feared. So my kids don't fear me. Uh, sometimes I feel a bit bad about that. So they don't fear me. So there's no way I frighten my kids. Even sometimes I want to. They're not fearing me. 
Some people, of course, I know everything fears them. They walk in, dogs run away, cockroaches, everything just disappears because daddy has come and everybody's scared. So this guy is angry and I don't understand why he's angry, so I'm cool about it. But he's more angry than the fact that I'm cool about it. So there's a gentleman, African gentleman, who's sprinkling with a truck, sprinkling, 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 sprinkling the place. He says to me, this guy says, I'll sprinkle your car. Now, listen, we're, we're in a Christian conference. Guys, listen, we're in a Christian conference. We're supposed to be, you know, Christians here. And then the guy says, I'll sprinkle your car. I respond, go ahead and sprinkle my car. I mean, I'm also now getting into, you know, I'm getting to the groove. I feel the flesh now. It's like, take like, go ahead and sprinkle my car. I say, so the black gentleman, Costa gentleman, sprinkle, 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 switches off the sprinklers, passes my car, switches on that one again, which doesn't help the guy who's angry. Because now the guy who's in the truck doesn't obey his instruction. Switches off the sprinklers and passes by and then switches it on again. Which, and then he, he then goes into walkie-talkie, calls the organizers of the conference, the main people who invited me there. Oh, no, the first before that, he talks to all the vendors around the area. He calls the vendors, he talks to them in Africa, and I don't hear everything he says. He goes, and I'm standing there and thinking, thinking somebody must tell me what have I done wrong. I'm, I'm waiting to be given clear instruction. What have I done wrong? He tells everybody else, they listen to him, they walk away, nobody responds to him. He still doesn't care, so they listen to him, they walk away. Then he calls the organizers of the mighty man, and they come. I mean, they should have seen the drama. Quad bikes, motorcycles, I mean, it's big. Everybody congregates, because there's a big thing that happened. And Ruthie comes, Ruthie comes and part of the group, comes straight to me, Africa, are you okay? That's what Ruthie said. I said, I'm okay. He looks back. Africa. Yes, I said, are you African club? I said, yes, I am. Why didn't you say so? <laughs> I said, why should I say so? So he didn't know that I am African club. Apparently, that would have worked. <laughs> if I said, do you know who I am? I suppose, I didn't know I was supposed to throw my weight around, you know. And so I realized, Sam, I looked at him and, um, and I realized he typically behaved towards me the way he behaves towards people who look like me, where he comes from. Not knowing that I am one of the VIP people here, one of the main speakers, but he just saw somebody who looks like his labor. And he acted, he acted the way he normally acts with people who look like me. He was utterly, utterly embarrassed and shocked. And he spent the next three days trying to assuage his guilt. I will be carrying something as small as a pen. He will be helping me. Can I help you? <laughs> Can I get this for you? Swiping my chair. I mean, I would, I would try to hide from him because he was always around me. Can I help you? No, sit here. I mean, I just, when I see him, I have to hide from him because he is so guilt-driven, he doesn't know what to do with himself. And I felt sorry for him. Because he just simply doesn't get it. He didn't get it. And although he's given a task at the conference because he volunteered, it doesn't mean his heart is in the right space. The fact that he serves there at some capacity doesn't mean his heart is in the right space with God first and with other people. I've showed up in his church in Northern Cape six months later, unrelated. They come and invited me to preach. I happened to meet with him at the parking lot. Incidentally, I arrive and he's arriving. He sees me and he starts from scratch. Oh, I'm so sorry for that. I said, I said, I said, I told my wife and I got home. I said, no, don't worry. Said, but six months later, he's still guilt driven. And it was totally unnecessary. And you know what's happening here? It is not necessarily what he did that day. What he did that day was good for him to expose him. It's not what he did that day. What he did that day was helpful for him to know the condition of his heart. What he now should do is to go and work at his heart rather than float around with guilt. Go and sit. I'm bad. Things are not good here. Let me stop pretending. You know, because when you're in a Christian conference like that, you are like in the things of the Lord. Right? We're in the things of the Lord. We're all here to worship Jesus. Therefore, it all sort of sanitizes us. It sort of covers us under the cloud of a Christian men's meeting. 
that it makes us all think we are okay with Jesus. When we're not okay with Jesus, we're just in a Christian bubble that makes us feel like we're okay. Now, why is it important for me? I once was preaching in my God congregation in Guazake, a lady township in, in, in PE, about non-racialism to black people. Okay? Telling black people why it's important not to hate on white people, why is it important for my congregation. My congregation members know that if they protest, they cannot ban a body. So they know that. That's what we teach. So I don't teach just you what you must do. I teach the gospel consistently in the same vein, the same value system. So I don't have a member of my church, as far as I'm aware, who can ban a building in protest. I don't think I can, I can ever be. I don't know anyone in my church who could do that because of what we teach. And we are very strong in teaching. Right? And so we teach one day. I was teaching, and I was teaching, and then I said something in my middle of my message, partly because of this thing of preaching without looking at your notes. You can make mistakes. So I made an example. I'm trying to express what people say about African migrants. They use the word queer, queer, which is derogatory word. I don't use that word. I never use that word. But then I used it in that day, not as a demonstration, but actually I used it, like used it, but not fully used it. I couldn't even be heard through the microphone because I, I held back before. So I said half the word. Nobody heard. I asked them, did you hear me? And nobody heard me. They didn't hear what I just said because I didn't say the full word. I held it back. But then I said to the church, but I heard myself, and I repent. They didn't know what I was talking about. I said, I heard myself, and I didn't think I still held that in my heart. And I said, I, I stopped my message. I said, I stopped my message. I need to repent before God. I didn't know I, as African club, still had that in my heart concerning African migrants. I will not allow this heart to be a cesspit for hatred. Right? So, you got to make that choice. And that choice, and preferably, this must not be a group project. We are participating in a project of reconciliation. We are going to Mamelodi to do a project of reconciliation. Oh. You will track all kinds of problems of people who would hide behind the project. And the, and the flag and the banner, but as in their hearts, they are not ready for it. And so I've had to search my heart around these issues quite significantly. In fact, one of my turning moments was when I was going up the stairs of UCT 1998 or something, looking for a church called His People, then in our every nation. So I heard about this church, and I wanted to visit this church, and I didn't know that that people make an issue of white church, black church. I didn't quite know. I just thought church is church, right? So I'm going up to the stairs of UCT. I meet two gentlemen, master dress. You know how Africans are. You know, we don't do this thing of shorts. <laughs> not, not us. We wake up and we iron clothes. <laughs> we, we make an effort to appear before the Lord. This thing of yours, of flops. Ah. I, I leave you. I leave you. I leave you, white people. I leave you. You've got your own issues. <laughs> so these gentlemen are carrying Bibles. They are well dressed. So I said to them, do you know his people? I thought they were going to a church meeting of his people. Their response then shocked me. No, we don't know where they are. We don't fellowship with those white people. 1998, I stood overlooking UCT, or Cape Town, standing at the stairs of UCT. I made a decision as a young believer there and then. I'm never joining their fellowship. Because of the tone of voice they used to talk about other believers, I knew that I'm not participating, I'm not part of that. I was a young believer, but I made a decision in my heart that they won't see me in, my, in, in their meetings. We were in fellowship with those white people. And I thought, wow. I was shocked, but I had a conviction. So I spent all that year in a so-called white church, which I had to answer for when I get back to the rest. Oh, so you are in a white church. I said, guys, I don't know about white or black. I just know I meet God there. There's God there. Lots of God there. Worship is good. Word is good. And I went there for God. I don't know white people and all this kind of stuff. I'm not going there for white people. I'm going there to have a meeting with God and, and I meet God there. And besides, I'm in Rondebosch. You know, it's walking distance. I said, I don't have money. Guys, I don't have money. I don't, I'm not going to Cape Town and take a train to Kylie just, just to be with black people. I, 
I mean, I don't have the means to go and be with black people in Kaili Tokuguletu. I walk to the church service in Rondebosch. It, 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 it makes sense. It's, it's convenient. I don't have, I can't be raising money just to be with black people. And I want to be with God. It's costly, this thing of being racist, really. Sometimes. Because you have to pay a price to go all the way across town to be with your people. No, I don't hear God among those people. I must hear God in my language. So I must go all over town to be in a place that makes me socially included or comfortable. Whereas sometimes it blocks my heart from expressing the missional heart of God to other people. Okay. So last point, and I'm going to close on this. Now, why? Now, I can tell you there are many good experiences I've had. Please, don't never misunderstand this. I've had wonderful experiences. And I will not change exchanges for anything. I've grown so much as a person as a result of it. My children have grown so much. I mean, when we travel, sometimes we travel together. So they've stayed in farms and resorts and hotels. So they have experiences because they know we go anywhere and we meet people from all over the place. I mean, I don't get stuck. In, I can't get stuck in South Africa. I hope you guys can also help me and be part of my... So when I, when I don't get stuck, like one day I was stuck over Harib Dam. I put it on social media and immediately I have somebody helping me and the police van came in to, to check if I'm okay. Because there's somebody who knows me somewhere in the country. And all of it is because of the gospel of Jesus Christ, at some point, we wouldn't have known each other socially, but because of Jesus, we end up getting to know each other. And I'm going to say, I'm, I'm, my, my tire was, was f deflated, but wherever they put, they changed my tires, they so tightened the, the knots that I couldn't untie them. So now here am I with every ounce of strength in me, the thing just slips, slips, <laughs> slips, doesn't come out. And then somebody came and fetched me and, and, and and, and towed me into town, some small town. And in that small town, there is somebody who's a child of God who came to our meeting in Mighty Bay and had the gospel. So he's responding not because I'm a black person or he's trying to be, I'm not a charity case. He's responding because there's a kin, kin folk spirit. There's a kinness. He's responding because of the kin spirit we have to each other. That I'm a brother in the Lord. We are brothers. So he's responding because a brother is in charge. Now when we respond like that, we don't we're not making each other uh, favors here. Like I had a guy whose name is Leon who stayed in my house for the whole year. When I tell people the story, they get shocked because, I mean, it's normally the other way around. <laughs> but that I mean, it's normally a white person who hosts a black man. So I had a white guy who stays in my house for the whole year, rent free. He drinks a lot of coffee. That's the only thing I can tell you. <laughs> every minute a kettle is boiling, every minute kettles get boiling. So one day, he's, and obviously, he's barefoot, you know, guys, some of the stuff you do. But he's very good at gardening, so he's an agronomist. So he just had our garden amazing. So we had a wonderful garden. And so that's one of the things I loved about him. He's a good in gardening. And, and so, but the problem is that he walks back with the garden soil and stuff with his feet and the house. And uh, so it was like, you get the good garden, but it comes with a price. <laughs> so he walks out like that, and he's, everything he touches is full of soil. I mean, yeah, you want the good crops. It grows big crops, but it comes at a price. Our house looks like a farm, you know. <laughs> so one day he comes out of, the, out of the room where he stays to boil the kettle. We are with an elderly lady from um, Berlin, uh, some place in the Eastern Cape by King Williamstown. She's here with her daughter, and so she's telling stories. No grandmothers, they tell stories. And so she's busy talking, yeah, yeah, and we're loving her story. We love, listen to her. She goes on and on and on until Leon comes out. So, and Leon comes out because he stays there. He's not like coming out like a stranger. So he comes comfortable, he goes to the kitchen, switches on the kettle. Grandma stops talking. <laughs> <laughs> she, 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 can't, she can't understand what just happened. <laughs> not only do I'm seeing a white person in your house, I'm seeing one who's like at home, who's like, Barefoot, put the kettle. So now we wanted to continue the story. The story was nice, but the story is not coming out. He's just like, <sighs> I said, yes, he stays here. So my pastor also did this to me. He was in my house one day, and he said to me, it's, it's a bit of joking. He says to me, you know this white person? There's a white guy in the house. I said, yes. He said, a white guy. No, he said, yes. You've got a white man in your house. I said, yes, I know. You know so now when I stayed with Leon, one of the things I needed to avoid doing was to avoid using him as some kind of a augmentation of my ministry. Using him as a, some kind of a validation of 
I can do this thing. Look at me. I had to avoid exposing him or using him in a way that validates me as a Christian. And make sure I don't expose him, I don't use him to validate me as, look at me, I have a white person, I'm also helping white person. I had to avoid doing that. The temptation was very high, especially in South Africa right now, with our racial polarization. You also want to show, but I, I, we, I can do this, look at me. And when you do that, of course, Jesus does also look at you, and is not very happy. So you're using my child to get glory from that. You have received your glory on earth. You won't receive it in heaven. So I had to make sure I walk with him as a true brother in the Lord without anything else. Although we had our challenges, of course, I said to work with cultural challenges and differences, right? I mean, I do one or two cup of coffee a day, a whole day. You guys do 10 or 11. <laughs> so I don't, I don't get that. And then you do black coffee and no sugar, and, and I, I don't know what, why you do what you do, but you do what you do. And so we're different. And then, you know, so, but all those differences of language, of shorts, when it's cold, you know, I mean, sometimes I look at a white person, I feel, I, I feel cold on their behalf. I mean, I'm looking at them. I'm already have a jacket, but I already feel cold by looking at them. I'm like, it makes me feel cold. So I look at that, and I look at language barrier, I look at, I look at food, I look at clothes, I look at this, and I look at that, and I think all of these things are inconsequential when I look at the main thing, the gospel of Jesus Christ. All these things are somehow small, but they become big when you're small-minded. When you're small-minded, the small things become big. But when you receive Jesus and you allow him to be big in your life, small things, you have perspective. Small things remain small. So when I go out in this place, in these meetings, and all I hear is people speaking Afrikaans because we're, we're in a meeting, and people are not in a meeting, but we're in a, in a house, and people are, are talking, and I don't want people to change how they speak because of my presence. I, don't want, I want people to make an effort of my presence. And because people are sure. So when I'm in that space and I feel a bit out, I have to... It's can, yes, they have a responsibility as well. I won't say they don't have a responsibility. So do I as well to actually moderate my heart and my attitudes towards others. I say, okay, fine. They must feel comfortable as well. It's fine if that's what makes them feel comfortable. It's okay. But I have to moderate my heart and attitude towards others and know that their commitment to the Christ I serve is not less because of our differences in culture. Amen. We'll stop there because of time. So what I want to pray about today is that um, I want to pray that God would give us that kind of a understanding of we have prayed about, we have sung about it in the song, and we have that understanding that we are called by Jesus to go out, make disciples of all nations. But I, because of the unique context in which you find yourself in South Africa, it's a bit of sometimes you know, dicey and difficult to do it in the context locally than it is to do it outside. But I wanted to know that Jesus doesn't have a problem with South Africa and is not stuck with South Africa. Jesus is not nervous over this country. He has things under control. I want you to know, we don't know what's going on, but it's not like same with him. He has a plan for this nation, and his plans will come to pass. He will have the last say. That's why we call him God. Right? You, you and I are not supposed to be bothered and worried about stuff like that. We're supposed to hold his hands and journey with him and let us see him through. Let us allow him to see us through to the victory line. We are going to see revival in this nation. We're going to see reformation in this nation. We're going to see a move of God in this nation. Because Jesus is in on his throne. You and I are his children, are his partners, his co-laborers. As long as we are on his team, this is a winning team. This team has already won. The victory has already been won. And so we are not trying to win. We operate from victory. Not trying to gain victory, but we operate from victory. And therefore these things are overcome. Let's stand together and just do the prayer and then we we'll close together. Father, I pray for each one this morning 
standing here and, and, and the sound of my voice. I know that everyone here is called by God for the ministry of reconciliation. It might be at work, it might be in a school, it might be in a community environment, it might be in an estate, it might be somewhere, whether marriage or cross-cultural, or between mother and child, or conflict between parent and child, any sense of reconciliation is our mission and our ministry. We embrace that. We don't want to run away from it. Give us the boldness and the courage to say yes to your mission. Where it's hard, help us to overcome our issues. And we know that it's not our strength, it's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by your spirit. We rely so much on your grace this morning to do what needs to be done in this country. We're a generation that has been born for such a time as this to deal with the issues that are unique for our context. And we are well able through you to do what you have called us to do. We surrender and we give all our lives to you today. In Jesus' name, thank you. Thanks for listening to this message from Shofar Christian Church. We believe that you enjoyed your time with us, establishing God's kingdom and His glory in your life. For more info, call us on 012-362-1363. Email us, pretoria at shofaronline.org. Browse our website, www.shofaronline.org. Or like us on facebook.com forward slash shofarpretoria.org.